All right, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Skull Puzzles. My name is Ipsita and I am a public programs intern for UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. We conduct research, education, and outreach for healthy coastal ecosystems and communities. And now at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Anne to start the program. Thanks, Ipsita. Hi everybody, my name is Ann Lindsay. I am one of the educators for the University of Georgia Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. And I work down in Savannah on Skidaway Island at the Marine Education Center and Aquarium. And I am so happy y'all have joined us for a program we're calling Skull Puzzles. I'm going to um, share with you a couple of slides in the beginning of this program, and then we're going to move to some live action interaction with skulls that I have here in the lab with me. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I'm out walking in the woods is look for leftovers from nature. And so um, I took a few pictures of things that I have found on Skidaway Island. So I'd like to give you just a little bit of time to make some observations as a naturalist might uh, about the thing that is on the ground here in this pig. And if you wanna keep those uh, observations to yourself or if you wanna type anything in the chat box, Ipsita can share those with me. All right, so if you have any observations, type them into the chat box. And we had one person ask or observe that maybe it's a jawbone. We had other people notice that there are some pine needles, some leaves around it. Um, and then one person noticed that it might be an herbivore. Okay, great observations, very good. We definitely are looking at the forest floor in a maritime forest. Let's go to the next naturalist observation. This is a picture I took in the same general area out in the maritime forest. Make some observations about this one, maybe in ways that are different from the previous slide. So we had one person notice that it was a lot smaller than the previous skull. We had other people notice that the um, teeth in the front seemed orange. And um, we had another person notice that the little fuzz that was right beside the skull. Okay, very good, great. So you're seeing details of what looks to be a much smaller skull lying on the ground. Got one more view for you. Let's make some observations about this item that's been found on the forest floor. Um, we had one person notice that um, it might be a carnivore. Um, it looks like a raccoon. Um, we had another person notice that its skull seemed a lot rounder and that it was bigger than the last skull. All right, very good. So all of you have been using clues to try and get yourself started in terms of identifying the owner of this skull. We're going to move through the next couple of slides just to share some information so that we're all on the same page. As we transition into some content, I want to start off by asking you a question. This will be a poll that Ipsita will run for us. What do we call animals with internal bony skeletons? All right, so you're going to see that pull pop up in front of you now. You can move it around um, to see the slide if you want to. And it looks like we have a lot of answers coming in and I'm gonna stop the poll in about five seconds. Um, and thank you to everyone that voted. All right, very good. Looks like most folks uh, thought that uh, an animal with an internal bony skeleton is called a vertebrate, and you are correct. Very good. So now we're going to continue uh, with our slides. Let's talk a little bit about the generals of skulls. Um, 
Skulls are part of a skeleton, right? But they're a very important part of the skeleton. Um, skeleton in general allows for an animal to do its thing in life. It allows the animal to move. It allows the animal to find a position in space or on ground or in water or in the air. And it also provides a system or a scaffolding, a structure to which muscles can attach um, to help the animal move. And, and make a living. A lot of times when we're, we are studying structures inside an animal, we talk a lot about form um, as it indicates function. So in a short way of saying, that means that an animal often looks the way it looks because it has a particular function or a particular thing. Here's a picture of a flounder. This is, a, this is the entire skeleton of a flounder. And you can see at the left-hand side with my arrow here, this is the skull area, but every single little bone in this flounder skeleton is very, very important. And they do the work of allowing the flounder to make a living. These are all um, would have supported spines. These are the ribs of the animal. This is the backbone of the animal. If you've cleaned a fish or maybe eaten a fish recently or eaten um, some, some chicken, um, you may be um, familiar with some of the bones that are in more common animals. Let's talk a little bit more about skulls. So skulls are pretty important. They do three important things. They hold and protect the brain up here. That's important. They hold sensory organs like your eyes, holes for your ears, holes for your nose. And they also hold the feeding structures. And by that, I mean your jaw and the teeth that are inside your jaw, as well as your tongue. And all skulls have a variation on, a, on a, a very simple theme. These are three skulls from three very different animals, but they each have a larger portion of the skull. In this one, it's missing a little bit, but over here, this is sort of the larger, more sturdier part of the skull. And then they have an elongated part of the skull. We often call that, in a mammal at least, we call it a, a snout. In this animal, we would call it the beak. Um, so each skull that we encounter today will look a little bit like our skull, in fact, but with some parts longer and some parts shorter and some parts squeezed together and maybe some parts taller. So let's think a little bit about skulls related to our head, because since we're humans and we're animals, that is often the, the best way to sort of think about other animals. So how many skulls do you think make up an adult human, I mean, how many bones, forgive me, make up the skull of an adult human? All right, so you'll see that that poll popped up once again, and thank you to everyone that voted. Um, I'm going to end the poll in about five seconds, so get your votes in. It seems that almost everyone voted, so I'm going to end the poll now. All right, and it looks like to me that everybody, we have sort of even answers. If you answered eight, you're correct. If you answered 14, you're correct. And if you answered 22, you are also correct. A human skull has eight cranial bones. Those are the bones back here that hold your brain. It has 14 facial bones. Those are the things that hold sensory organs and are part of your jaw apparatus or structure. And those two numbers together are 22. So a human skull has 22, um, 22 bones in total. All right, let's talk a little bit about how bones and therefore how skulls work. You know, bones are, bones are living tissues. They are part of, a, of an animal structure and bones are always under construction. They're either being, uh, they're either growing or they are breaking down. And there are living cells that are responsible for all of that work. An osteoblast is the kind of cell that builds um, new, Bone, bone tissue or bone cells. And, um, and then we have osteocytes, which help to maintain that living bone and osteoclasts, which help to recycle or break down old bone. 
It's interesting to note that even as bone is hard, it's made of a lot of water. And there's some other things listed here. Bone is also made of blood vessels and nerves. It holds marrow. Some bones hold marrow. The, hard, the hardness of a bone is related to minerals, calcium, phosphorus, and other minerals that we get from our diet. So when your grandma reminds you to drink milk or get a little calcium in your, in your blood, as you do when you get older, that's the reason to keep your bones nice and strong. Bones also fit together as puzzle pieces, and that's particularly noticeable in a skull. And I'll show you some images of that in a few minutes. Bones grow and meet along the cracks or what we call sutures. And each small puzzle piece of bone grows as the animal ages. But most of that growth is occurring along the edges of that puzzle piece rather than in the middle. At least that's true for a skull bone. There are lots of spaces and holes typically, oops, sorry, in a skull, and we call them generally foramen. And those are, those are um, spaces to hold things, maybe to hold your eyes, um, maybe to hold a blood vessel or a, um, a nerve. We talked a little bit already about cranial and facial bones and how they differ. And just a reminder that there are, there's connective tissue in there that's helping the bones fit together in an entire structure um, called a skeleton. Cartilage, which attaches bone to bone. So when, you're, when your knees give out and they tell you you need more cartilage between your bones, that's one of the things that's impacted. Oops, sorry. Go back. Sorry. Okay. Tendons then, sorry to just pick up that last term, tendons help connect muscle to bone. Here's a close-up look of a suture or a series of sutures. Um, this is a deer skull and you can see this little squiggly line here. That is, and as my arrow goes around, I am outlining one entire bone of the skull. Here's another bone of the skull. Here's a, th a third bone of that entire skull. And so they're fitting together as sutures. Here's a close-up of an alligator skull. And here you can also see some sutures here. Um, so we would have similar things in our skull. Now it's interesting, the alligators also have all these little pits and what look like little rivulets. Um, and those we think have um, a function related to thermoregulation. They're very close to the skin. This is from the, the surface or the top of um, an alligator skull. So we think that they might have something to do with the animal regulating its body temperature or maybe allowing it to release, um, to monitor or regulate its pH. Here's an example of a foramen. This, this thing right here looks like a little tunnel, doesn't it? And it would have held uh, particularly muscles. These things right here might've been openings or holdings for blood vessels. Um, maybe a series of blood vessels went through here. Um, and a lot of the little pits could also be used to hold or provide access for nerves. Here's another quick picture of we're actually looking at that same deer skull on the left and then the animal on the right, the skull on the right is um, a um, bobcat. And if you look inside here, there are all sorts of little curly cues of bone. And those would have, they are very delicate bones and they would have supported, again, blood vessels and nerves. This is a very sensitive part of the animal's body. And the same is true over here too. So holes and bumps and arches all mean things on skulls. Let me point out a couple, and I don't have these words up on the screen, so I'll just, I'll just, I'll just tell you what they are. Um, but there are, oops, where'd my lawyer? So this is that same skull we looked at before. Um, it is actually, um, this, is, this is the hole at the back of the skull, and that's where the spinal column and, and vertebrae would have connected. Um, to this part of the bone, the skull, with another bone called an atlas. 
Um, these things right here, these arches, we have them in our own skull. There are these things right here. Those are your cheekbones, but we call that a zygomatic arch. So those are features, typical features of a skull. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the clues that we might use to identify a skull. Um, and here they are listed, and then we're going to go through each of them. Depending on where you've found the skull, that might give you a clue as to what, what animal used to own it. So if you find a skull on the beach, for example, um, it might be related to a fish that was living in the ocean or maybe a bird that lived nearby. Generally, skulls have different size and shapes. There's a great diversity of them. Generally, skulls and animals have different kinds of jaws and teeth. They may have differences in the brain case and the snout portions. The, again, this cranial part of your face and the, the snout part. Um, and they may also have some additions and subtractions, things that you don't see on all skulls. So let's talk a little bit about those. Here's a picture of all of the skulls that I'm gonna share with you today. And I've given you a little bit of reference for size um, with a tennis ball down in the left-hand corner. And we're not gonna stop to identify all these skulls. I just want you to notice that there is great diversity in the kinds of skulls that we might find in the coastal area. This is a great skull to talk about jaws and teeth with. Let's pause here and um, I'm gonna ask you to write in the chat box um, the name of the animal that you think held this skull when it was living. And Ipsita will share that with me. So we've had guesses for Piranha, barracuda, gar, maybe a carnivorous fish. Um, barracuda had a bunch of responses actually. So uh, yeah. yeah, very good. Well, right on everybody. It is definitely a fish and it is a barracuda, right? This is one of the teaching skulls that we have here at the aquarium. And what we know about barracuda is that they have a powerful, they have a powerful sort of, um, they, they, they hit a fish and then they grab it and then they cut it and they stab it. So these are stabbing teeth that that fish could use to hang on to a wiggling prey. And then these are slicing teeth. So we know that this fish eats other animals based on the kinds of teeth it has um, and generally the size of its jaw as well. That indicates that it has a fairly powerful bite to it. This is where the eye would have gone. Let's move on to the next slide. This should be familiar to a lot of you. You know, if you've been to the dentist recently or you remember being in school and learning about all the teeth in your own skull, just a reminder that there are generally four teeth types, tooth types. Um, there are incisors. Those are the ones up front. Those are your bunny teeth. They help you cut, cut through a carrot, um, but they help bunnies do the same thing. Um, the next are canines. Those are typically what we think of as our fangs. Some animals who are predators have very pronounced canines. Those are for grabbing and stabbing. And then we also have premolars. Premolars are generally those teeth that are just behind the canines and they're good for cutting and slicing and processing. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. And then finally, the molars in the way back of your mouth those are the teeth that are good for mashing and grinding and processing further big pieces um, of food in your mouth down to smaller pieces. And here are some images of some uh, kinds of those teeth. So the one on the left um, is groundhog skull and it's got pretty pronounced um, incisors. It's got um, uh, the incisors are sort of brownish because this animal has a little bit of iron in the, the outer layer of its tooth, the enamel of its tooth. The one to the, to the right of that is um, a mink skull. This is a predator, but it's got really pronounced um, fangs or canines. It still has incisors and it's got some cutting teeth in its lower jaw. It also has another pair of canines in its lower jaw. This is a horse tooth 
Horses are good at grinding things. They also have um, incisors. This is a dolphin tooth. This is a raccoon tooth. And the one on the right is um, a tooth that fell out of a, a hog skull that I had a long time ago. So a variety of tooth types. All right, so you gotta have teeth in order to eat um, if you're a mammal um, and if you're other kinds of animals too, but not all animals have teeth in the, in the animal world. But we can get an idea of what animals eat based on the kinds of teeth that they have in their mouths. So carnivores are meat eaters. They typically have all four types of, of um, teeth. Herbivores are what we call plant eaters. They typically have maybe not as well developed canines and they do a lot of processing and grounding and cutting. And then omnivores generally eat all sorts of things. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of carnivores have, have jaws that open and close and they are good at cutting, go at opening up and down. Herbivores and omnivores have jaws that can open up and down, but they can also slide side to side and they can move forward and back. So that herbivores and omnivores really have some multiple ways to, to um, process their food. All right, we're almost done with teeth and, jo and, and jaws and then we're gonna take a break and see if there are questions. The, um, slide, the picture on the top, this is a deer lower jaw or what we call a mandible, that's the word that we might use. The one below it um, belongs to a bobcat and the one to the right of it, it belongs to a, a wild hog. And you'll notice that the hog has these really elongated canines that we would call tusks. They're sort of flattened and sharp on one side and pointed at the end and they help the animal root around in the ground. So let's stop here and see if there are any questions. Oops, I'm sorry. Let's do a little poll and then we'll take some questions after that. The next poll is, are we carnivores, herbivores or omnivores? Depending on our teeth. We have a ton of responses coming in, so thank you. And it seems we are split between two of the options. And I'm gonna end the poll in about five seconds. So get your answers in if you would like to answer. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll about now. All right, very good. Now, really there's no wrong answer for this one either because humans have teeth that allow them to eat meat as a carnivore might. We have teeth that allow us to uh, eat as an herbivore and as an omnivore. So omnivores, again, have teeth that allow them to eat a variety of diets. Now, you may choose as a human not to eat meat, but your teeth still allow you to eat meat if you, if you want it. All right, great. We're going to move on to the next, next slide. Oops, I'm sorry. Let's back up just a second. Ipsita, do we have any quick questions? I know that was a lot of information, a long, long run of content. Yeah, so we have two questions here. The first is, what made you want to study marine biology? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, I think short answer is that I grew up around oceans. I grew up going to the West Coast. I'm a Georgia girl, but I grew up going to the West Coast and it just sort of parlayed into a career in marine education. Thanks for asking. That's awesome. And then we had another person ask, um, do you have any dinosaur bones? Uh, not with me, no, but I do have some of those at home for sure. But I don't have any to share with you today. They're awfully cool though. And then we have one question that just came in. Okay. Um, how long does it take for tissues to decompose to only expose the bone? Oh, that's a really great question. And there's no one answer because if you leave, you know, there are lots of forces that can work on a, on a bone. You have a bone that's lying in the sun or a bone that's been on the forest floor for a while. Smaller animals, scavengers might help break down the skeleton and take away all the muscle. Um, 
If it sits out in the open air for a while, it might break down because of the sun. If it's buried for a while, that uh, allows it to be more closely in contact um, with some of the detritivores and things that help us um, break down organic matter. So great question. That's a great experiment to do in your backyard though. You could take a chicken bone if you have a chicken um, if you have a piece of chicken or a piece of fish, bury it in your backyard and then leave one out, maybe underneath a little cage and see what happens. Great question. All right, let's move on. We've got a few more clues to talk about and then we're gonna get to the good stuff. Um, remember in the beginning, we talked a little bit about cranial bones in a skull and facial bones in a skull. So these are three animals here. I've got um, a, a groundhog here and then the middle one is a raccoon and the one on the right is a bobcat. And you'll notice that each of them is about the same size, but the bobcat has a larger cranium. It's got more space for its brain and it's got a shorter facial area. So if you think about your cat at home, I have two cats at home. If you think about your cat, they sort of have a snub nose. You compare that to a dog, if you have a dog, most dogs, let's say a lab, which has a much longer nose. So we can use that sort of relative brain case size to snout size to help us get an idea of, of who used to own the skull. The next thing we wanna talk about is eye position. So eyes are pretty important in our world. Um, certainly as humans, we depend on our visual system. Um, we're not as good smellers, but we're really good lookers and we're pretty good. We can hear pretty well, but really we use our eyes mostly. The animal on the left also uses its eyes mostly. That's the bobcat skull. The animal on the right also uses its eyes to help it find prey at the bottom of the ocean. Both of these animals, the bobcat and the one on the right, is a turtle skull. It's a loggerhead skull. Both of these animals are predators. They have large eyes relative to the rest of the size of their body and their eyes face forward like my eyes do in my skull. And that allows us predators to focus on a single thing in front of our face. Not all animals need to do that though. There are other animals that we think of as prey items or prey animals that typically have eyes on the side of their head. So the top skull is a deer and the bottom skull is um, a rabbit. And both of those are animals that hang out in, hang out in um, broad open areas, but would need eyes around them to look for predators. And in some cases, herd in a lot of cases, herd animals have eyes on their side. Again, because they're working as a group to avoid being, um, being hunted by a predator. And then finally, skulls often have extras. So they have either some have horns or antlers and some are missing things entirely. A little bit of about information about horns and antlers. So horn, horns are an extension of the skull. This is all bone and this is bone as well, right? And on top of that extension of the skull when the animal was living, would be a layer of keratin. It looks a little bit like our fingernails. The animal below is a, that's a deer skull. I'm sure a lot of you recognize that. And it has antlers that drop after a certain point in the year. There is bone in the antler as well, but there's a little piece of bone on the skull that is permanent in the skull and that's called the pedicel. And so um, when a male deer has gone through rut and its testosterone has lowered because it doesn't need to be involved in, in chasing uh, the, the lady deers, it can drop, um, those antlers will drop off. Antlers are also covered, at least when the animal is, is growing them with um, a, a, a layer called velvet and that's got a blood supply to it. Then the animals on the right, let me just ask you, what do you think this is the skull? Oops, what do you think that's a skull for? Let me go back. Anybody got any ideas?
We had multiple people say um, a bird, perhaps. Yes, perhaps is correct. It is a bird. This is probably a tern skull. So this is a bird. This is a skull I found on the beach um, or was here at the center. It was found on the beach primarily. And so um, these animals have, again, they've got bony extensions of their skull, but we call that a beak in a, in a bird. And on top of that beak, there would be a layer of that keratin bubble um, layer. And then this is a female deer, so it doesn't have those little pedestals because it doesn't support antlers. And then this is that turtle skull again. Turtles don't have teeth, um, but they also have a part of their skull called a beak, which is covered by um, another structure called a tomium. If we have time, I'll show you one of those from the other camera. So now we are going to try and use what we've learned. And in order to do that, I'm gonna to need to stop sharing this screen and switch to another camera. It's gonna take me a second to do that. So here's a camera that I have set up in the lab. Um, and you'll, you'll notice that I'm gonna use a little white piece um, of paper, not to try and distract you, but it helps the camera pick up the color of the skulls that I have here. Um, and actually, I'm gonna slide those skulls out of the picture because I wanted to start with these skulls. And I'll move some of these other things out of the way and hopefully, oops, that out of the picture too. So I have a series of skulls here. They go from larger to smaller. And I'll just give you, a, I'm just gonna hold them up to the camera so you can see a little bit more about them. And then I want you, if you don't mind, write some white, what you think these are. Are these animals herbivores or do you think they are carnivores? We had some people say herbivores and then other people say carnivores. Um, and then we had a couple of people um, say that they could be rodents. Yes, they could be for sure. At least most of these are rodents. You're right. So let's take a look at them more closely. Let's start little. How about that? So this is a, a tiny little skull of a rodent, right? It has elongated incisors that would have been used for gnawing and cutting right? Um, along its upper jaw, it has some grinding teeth out back. It's not a really big skull. This skull belonged to what we call a cotton rat that we see a lot down here on the coast. Um, the next one up is a little bit larger, but it is an interesting skull. This is the skull of a non-rodent. This is the skull of a rabbit. Rabbits are really interesting. They're, they're sort of classified in their own grouping because instead of having two sets, two incisors, as our cotton rat did, our rodent did, they actually have two sets of incisors, meaning they have four incisor teeth. And they've got this really interesting little hole behind their incisors. That hole is called um, a, a diastema. And it's a hole that allows... I'm sorry, it's not, that's not another skull, sorry. But this is a space that allows food to be processed um, by the incisors and those, some of those foods can, can um, be pushed out the side of the mouth if needed. You'll see it has eyes on the side of its head. We turn it around. This is where the, the uh, spinal column or the vertebral column used to attach. And we know that rabbits are pretty good gnars, and so they have a fairly substantial lower or lower jaw called a mandible. Here's the next um, skull up, next herbivore up. This is a groundhog skull. Um, I used to live and work in Maine and Michigan, and that's where I got this one. Um, it also has some incisors. What we know about rodents is that as they chew, they sharpen their incisors. And if they aren't able to gnaw or cut with their incisors, their incisors will grow. 
Um, and so they have to maintain the sharpness of those incisors by constantly gnawing um, and, and cutting and using them. And then finally, this skull, I'll ask you, it's the largest of the rodents that we know about, at least in our neck of the woods. Anybody want to take a guess at what kind of animal they think this is? We had a ton of people respond with a beaver. You are right. It is a beaver. Check it out. It's got a flat head, right? A lot of times all we see a beaver are their heads or the backs of their bodies, sometimes their tails. So they have a very low profile. Eyes would have gone here. They've got big, big zygomatic arches, which means they that uh, helped to root very powerful muscles to their lower jaws, right? And this is what I started to talk with you a little bit earlier about. That's called the diastema, and that's an extra space that the animal can use to sort of hold pieces of wood that it doesn't, pieces of wood or pieces, whatever it's eating bark. Um, back from going further down the animal's um, uh, throat. So they can sort of close off parts of the back of their mouth so they don't swallow stuff by, by mistake that they don't mean to swallow. Very good, those are herbivores. Let me switch now to my page of different kinds of animals. And I'll bet you're guessing, I bet you figured out that, you know, these are not herbivores because they've got really well-developed canines in many cases. And so I have a variety of different skulls here. Um, this is the skull of a mink. This is our sort of, they are, we, we had a mink um, actually swimming in our turtle pond out front a couple of years back and we took some video. It might still be up on our, one of our YouTube pages or Facebook pages. But mink are small versions of otters, for example, and they eat animals, right? So they've got canines and they've got ripping, tearing sort of um, premolars back there that help them process. They also spend a lot of time in the water, so they've got a fairly flat head. This next one is an otter skull. Um, and again, an animal that lives in the water, it's got a nice flat skull, eyes on the top, nose, very large nose up near the top of its head, so it can come up to the surface and breathe if it wants to. Now otters live, you know, they breathe with lungs and they, they spend as much time on land as they do off in the water, but the foods they like to eat are in the water. So otters typically eat a variety of fish and shellfish, and so they've got canines that help them grab those things, but then they've also got these great processing teeth back here that can help them crush, crush the shell of um, a rib mussel, for example, or maybe some other kind of shelled animals they find out in one of our tidal rivers or tidal creeks. Here's another skull. This one is the skull of a possum. Possum looks a lot like a carnivore, doesn't it? I mean, it's got some pretty extended canines, but, we, but what we know about possum is that they are omnivores. Possums, like raccoons, are scavengers. So their teeth indicate that they have a primarily meat diet, but we know in watching them that their behavior is a little bit different. And then finally, this is our last uh, truly predator or carnivore skull. This is the skull of a bobcat. And you can see that it's got really, really pronounced canines, which could be used to hold on to a mouse if they've caught it, or maybe a rabbit if they've caught it. We know that bobcat are very active in the evening. They've got really, really large eyes to gather lots of food light and they really depend on their eyes to help them find prey. Um, compared to say the skull um, that I have here, it's not big enough to sit on top of that, that piece of paper, but this is the skull of a coyote, right? And so a coyote, very much like our, our domestic dogs, also has canines, but maybe not as pronounced, not as sharp um, as those other animals. Let me pull my... Oops, see if that works better to see the picture. Can't see it a little bit better. But this is where the eyes would have went back here. They also have some good cutting teeth and processing teeth out back. 
So that is our suite of carnivores, um, our suite of, of mostly predators, some scavengers. Um, let's stop here and see if there are any quick uh, questions about those skulls in general. And I can actually, I'll put these other skulls in the camera too. So if you have any questions about the other ones that I pulled out, a couple questions. Yeah, so if you have a question, just pop it into the chat box. Just a reminder, make sure you are in speaker view. You can do this by clicking the icon in the top right corner if you are not already in it. You should have a large video on your screen with small vid videos at the top or side of your screen. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, one question is, do coyotes live here in Georgia? Yes, coyotes do live here in Georgia. They live all over the state. All right, and then we had another question. Um, what is your favorite part about your job? Gosh, the favorite part about my job, I think, is working, well, it's two things. It's working with people because I love teaching, but I also like teaching outside. I like hanging outside. <laughs> so, so my job allows me to do a little of both. Thanks for asking. Um, so we have two more questions. Um, which skull has the sharpest teeth? Oh, well, that's a great question. I mean, my for my money, I would say, you know, a bobcat has got pretty sharp edges. It tips to the to the um, canines, but a beaver and a rabbit, because they are gnawing and constantly sort of sharpening that edge of the incisor, that'd be a close runner up. Or maybe they're equal, depending on your perspective. And then um, how do you find these skulls? Great question. I will, in all, honestly, uh, you know, they come from a variety of different places. Some of them are here at the center and they are teaching skulls and are in our teaching uh, collection. Some of them have special permits in order to have. Um, some of these skulls I borrowed from my friend, John Crawford. Um, John is one of, he's our senior naturalist here and he and I have had long conversations about a variety of skulls. And then some of them I've collected over my decades of life? Great question. All right, I think we're ready maybe to move on to some larger skulls. I'm gonna slide these sort of groups of skulls out of the way um, and show you some larger skulls. And maybe we'll just, I'll just pull one of those larger skulls up and see if you guys can figure out um, what it is. All right, how about, um, let's see. How about this one? So I'll show you all around. Here's the side view. Here's the front view. Here's another side view. Let me get the, the upper and lower jaw articulated, and here's the back end. What do you think? And here's a tennis ball, just as reference. Let's put that we in had, um, We had guesses for um, boar, pig, um, wild hog, or um, wart hog, and yeah. Yeah, this is a wild hog. This is the skull of a wild hog. And we have those down here um, in the coastal area for sure. Um, and they, we see them out in the woods here um, at our site on Skidaway Island. We see them on the beach. Um, we know that wild hogs can, can do, some, do some damage. They can, well, you know, they do the things that they do. It's not that they mean to do damage, but we know that, that hogs can root around and, um, you know, maybe if you're trying to keep your path through the woods nice and neat, hog might have a different idea about that. And they use these big tusks to help them root around and dig through, through, the, through the soil um, to find all sorts of things to eat. All right, good job. Let's see, let's do the next one. This one is a little bit bigger, but I think still, small enough to be able to see on the camera. 
right? And I'll show you all sides of it. Big eyes. It's missing a portion of the facial bone, so you're not seeing the entire skull. And it's got these handy handles back here. You may want to take a guess at what that is. So we've had guesses for steer, bull, or cattle, um, and cow. Yeah, so this is a cattle skull for sure. And these are horns. These are extensions of the animal's skull. It's definitely a herd animal, got eyes on the side. And even though it doesn't have teeth, you can see that it might have it had holes for sort of squarish teeth that would have been really good at processing food. Cows are one of those um, hooved animals called ungulates. All right, let me see, let's try another one. Here's another skull, we'll switch out. Take a look at this one. Now, I think you've seen some like this already, um, but I wanted to show you this one mainly to be able to help you understand the size of some of these animals that we see here on the coast. Anybody know what this skull belonged to? So we've had numerous guesses for turtle and sea turtle, and then some more specific guesses for um, either leatherback turtles or a loggerhead sea turtle. Very good guesses, all, all um, very uh, on the money. This one is a loggerhead sea turtle, has really big eyes. This is the tomium that I was talking to you about. So it's made of keratin. Um, and it's that sort of like, that's the same stuff that our fingernails are made out of, same thing that, that reptile scales are made out of. Um, and so that provides a sharper cutting surface. Now, what we know about loggerheads is that they have very powerful muscles and they crush their prey. They're not always eating small things. And so these two large spaces here, or foramen, as we were using that term earlier, would have held giant bundles of very powerful jaw muscles. The hole right here is the place where the brain, um, up in there is where the, the sort of smallish brain would be, and this is where the animal's skull would connect to its vertebral column. So this is a very, very large animal, but it has a relatively small brain compared to the rest of the size of its body. And you know these things can be hundreds of pounds at adults. And that doesn't necessarily mean that a, a sea turtle doesn't have, um, doesn't have the tools to make its way in life. Maybe it doesn't have the uh, complex thinking um, capabilities that a mammal might have, or maybe a dolphin, but it certainly can do all the things it needs to do in order to make a living in the, in the world. All right, I've got a couple more to show you, and then we're gonna stop and see if you have just general questions. This is a really big skull. Now, this skull is on loan from the Savannah Science Museum. This is not my skull. Um, it's on loan to us. And I'm just going to see if you can figure out what this one is. Again, here's the tennis ball. It's a big skull. And I will let you know it's very heavy. And I will also point out this ridge that runs down the length of its the, the cranial or the, the, the brain box back there, that's called a sagittal crest. And a sagittal crest allows muscle attachment. So this animal, when it was living, had super powerful jaws. Anybody want to take a guess? So we had guesses for bear, cougar, horse, and mammal. It is definitely a mammal and it is a bear for sure. Bears are, they have teeth that might make, make you think that they're just meat eaters, but actually black bears, the ones that live here in Georgia, um, are omnivores. And so they um, are eating some plant material, berries, other things they might be finding, but they're also capable of eating prey items. Now, this skull is wired shut, so I can't open it up to show you those back teeth. Um, but the first time I saw this skull, it just blew me away. Because it's so big, it's heavy, it probably weighs about mm, 
probably eight pounds. I'm using a little bit of my muscle to pick it up. It's just a really impressive skull. Awesome. All right, let's see. I've got one more. Um, actually, I've got three to show you on the big screen. So let's stop here and see if you have any quick questions. And while you're doing that, I'm going to switch my camera um, so that I can use my big camera. We had a question about whether a bigger skull, does it mean that the animal has a bigger brain? Well, that's a great question relative to the, uh, you know, the size of other animals with other brains, sure. And size and animals in terms of skulls and hands and the length of your arms and legs and the length of your torso are all sort of relative. It's hard to compare you could compare a giraffe with a deer and a giraffe has a larger ne a longer neck and it has a longer neck not only compared to that deer but also a longer neck compared to the other parts of its body that's a tricky question a good one though is there time for one more question yeah so one person was asking about how old um, of a bear has a skull that size Ooh, an adult bear. <laughs> That's my answer. I don't know. I've not seen enough bears up close. I mean, I have seen bears up close, but not that close. But I would say that that's an adult skull. And bears are fairly long-lived mammals. And then a quick question. Um, why were the teeth on some of the skulls orange? Well, some of those, like that bear skull I was just showing you, remember in the beginning I talked about how you could, well, maybe I didn't, but you can put um, you can put a shellac or a clear acrylic lacquer on top of a skull to help protect it for the ages. Um, and so that's what happened, at least with that bear skull. It's just been, the bone itself has been covered with um, a clear acrylic and it turns yellowish as it gets older. All right, let me show you these really big skulls because you might have some questions about them. Um, one of them is right behind me. And I'm guessing that a lot of you will know what this is. I don't even think I did it all in the camera. There it is. All right, what do you think it is? Telepsida. We had a bunch of guesses for gator and alligator. Yep. One and the same, gator and alligator. Not a crocodile, but this is an American alligator skull. Um, and again, it is also on loan from the Savannah Science Museum. Alligators have a low profile. They live in the water. So their eyeballs are at the top. Their nostrils down here at the other end of the skull are close to the surface of the water. Um, alligator skulls are fascinating. And this alligator was a good nine feet maybe long, um, big adult alligator. Um, and it's interesting that alligators have a really interest, uh, have all these crazy holes and pits all along um, the upper surface and the lower surface. We talked a little bit about that um, when I was showing you close up pictures, but you'll see that there are a lot of holes along the length of the lower jaw of this alligator. And we think that those holes provide a space for nerves um, to um, come in contact with a stimulus. What we know is that alligators have better sense of touch than even our fingertips do. They're very, very sensitive to vibrations in the water that allow them not only to find each other when it's mating time, but also to detect movements in the water um, so that they can make a living as hunters. Alligators eat mostly fish. Um, they do not eat people. Here's the upper jaw of the alligator and you can see the holes where the teeth went. Alligators, a single alligator may have over 3000 teeth in its life. So it's making new teeth and losing teeth all the time. But each of those teeth looks like an ice cream cone, a really sturdy ice cream cone that helps them grab their prey item and hold on to it and then maneuver it in order to swallow it or pieces of it. All right, next big skull. 
I'm gonna show you this one. I'm gonna have to step off camera for just a second to get it. Here's an interesting skull. Now, I'll give you a hint. You're not gonna find this skull up in the mountains. This is a coastal animal. Here's the backside, it has a very large brain case, but it also has a fairly long snap area. This is the upper jaw of that animal. You can see that it had holes there for its teeth. We're missing the lower jaw. Here's, um, here's a lower jaw or part of a lower jaw. It has similar sort of teeth. This one didn't actually go to this skull, but anybody wanna take a guess? It has this interesting thing up here too. We had a bunch of guesses for dolphin. You're right, it's a dolphin. I can't fool you. Dolphins are crazy. They've got the nostril or the nose hole on the top of their head. So that's what this is. Very cool. This is a skull of a bottlenose dolphin. And this is a skull that, that requires a special permit. It's one of our uh, teaching skulls here at the Marine Education Center and Aquarium. That's not a skull that I'm allowed to have in my own home, nor would you be able to either. Okay, last skull, biggest skull. So big, I have to use two hands and all my arm strength. Here it is in all its glory. What do y'all think this is? We had a ton of guesses come in for horse. It's a horse, yep, of course it's a horse. Eyes on the side, big inside, little bitty sort of canine-like teeth that don't really help too much. Um, and then lots of grinding, processing teeth out back and powerful, uh, jaw muscles, big, broad surfaces that allow for lots of muscles um, to attach. Very good, y'all. That's all the skulls I have. Who's got questions in the last few minutes that we have? Um, one last question. Um, someone asked, um, why do you need a permit to have some skulls? Well, some skulls are protected by, uh, the animals that own them are protected by law, as are their bones. So uh, migratory birds, for example, there's something called the Migratory Bird Act. It's illegal for you to have uh, a part of a bird skeleton, a feather, a skull in your personal possession without a permit. And permits can be research permits, it might be exhibition permits if you work for a museum or an education center, um, but those are things that you have to get through government resources. Some are state permits and some are federal permits. For example, the sea turtle that we have here on site, we have to have a state permit and a federal permit to have that live animal in the aquarium. Great questions. Ipsita, are we about out of time? Yep. Bye everybody. Yeah, so thank you so much, Anne. Um, we are out of time now, but if you had fun today, then I hope you will consider joining us next Tuesday at 11 a.m. for Meet the Fleet. In addition, every Thursday at 2 p.m., we have a virtual series for family with families with children ages four to eight years old, with this week being all about crabs. This is the first summer that we have done virtual programs, and your feedback is incredibly valuable for shaping what these programs look like moving forward please take one minute to fill out the survey in the chat box. The chat box will disappear when we end the meeting. So go ahead and click that link now or copy and paste into a new window so that you have it for after the meeting. I do wanna give a big thank you at this time for any friends in the audience as your donations and support help us offer educational programming this summer. And if anyone is interested in becoming a friend, the application is on our website. You can also stay connected with us after this program by attending other public programs following us on social media, or learning about our volunteer and internship opportunities. Thank you for joining us and see you next week.